what do you do when what God does doesn't line up with who it is that he claims to be? What do you do when your expectations of God and your experiences of him feel like these mismatched socks that don't really go together? We all have this. We all go through it or we will go through it. And before we get to what we do with that, I'm going to tell you what you have. When that takes place, do you know what you have? Doubt. See, doubt is nothing more than a conflict. Doubt takes place when you and I are forced to see the world's badness, but we only hear about God's goodness, right? So we hear that God is a father, but we may not have one or have a good one. We hear about the love of God, but we experience sometimes his hateful and spiteful people. We hear about how God is a healer, but we find ourselves facing chronic sickness. We hear about a God that can raise the dead, and we have to bury our loved ones. What do you do when what God says doesn't line up with who he is? Before we get to what we do, I'll tell you what you have. What you have is doubt. It's present in all of our hearts. You can deny it if you want to, but you don't have to. Doubt does at least two things. Doubt can extinguish our faith, and doubt tends to isolate us. Here's the first thing. Doubt can extinguish your faith. If faith is like a fire, um, doubt is the over-eager kid that is ready to blow out somebody else's birthday candle. Uninvited, you don't know where it comes from or why it does it, but it does it, and you find yourself having to relight something that shouldn't have to be relit. And it's much easier to relight a birthday candle than it is to relight your faith. Doubt can come along and just extinguish the little faith that we have. Or doubt can isolate us, can it? Isn't it hard to find a community of faith where you can be honest with your doubts? Some of us in here maybe have grown up in a church tradition or a church background where as soon as you start to voice some of the doubts that you have, you're kind of viewed or looked at as if you're abnormal. Don't do that kind of stuff here. Something's wrong with you, and you may have found yourself in a place where in order to be honest with your doubt, you felt like you had to check out of the church or Christianity and check into a group of people that are honest with their doubts. But the problem is uh, sometimes some of the people that are most honest with their doubts are those that are most settled in their unbelief towards God. So you find yourself sharing your doubts with people uh, that aren't sympathetic. They already have firm conclusions, and that's not really helpful. What do we do with our doubt? Doubts like that house guest that comes over unannounced, and regardless of all the hints that you drop, you can't quite get them to leave? How do we make doubt leave? There's some folks that think, hey, here's how you make doubt leave, especially doubt towards God. Just give them the benefit of the doubt. Just assume the best and keep it moving. The problem is that doesn't work well, does it? What you find out or what you may find out, like I have found out, is that when it comes to God, unasked questions never stay that way. Unasked questions are like wet cement. They form and they firm into these hardened conclusions. So questions like why God never really just stay in the realm of why God. Questions like why God turn into how could you God, which is more of a statement than it is a question. So what do we do with our doubt? Does doubt mean the end of our faith? 
do the winds of doubt always have to blow out the little flame of our faith? The answer is no. And all I want to do in my time up here is to show you that doubt is not your enemy. That the presence of doubt doesn't exclude you from being a person of faith. But we are going to need to do something with our doubt if it's going to be helpful. And that's why we're here in the book of Habakkuk. It's three chapters long. We're not going to go through the whole thing. We're only going to go through the first part. And my goal is I just want to get you started on this journey. So I'm going to just give a precursor right here. I'm going to bring up questions and issues for which I may not provide an answer because all of your doubts will not be resolved in 45 minutes. There's no magic bullet to take care of all of those doubts. I just want to show you from God's word, I think what to do with them. So here's a little bit of background about Habakkuk. We know more about Israel than we do about him. Israel at this time was about 25 years away from experiencing God's judgment because of their failure to live like he called them to. So it was a nation that was full of injustice, socioeconomic disparity, the people in power were oppressing the weak, the laws were distorted. It was this nation of people that were living far from the way that God had called them to live, but they assumed that they were still good with God. So if you lived at this time and you walked by, chariots would have a bumper sticker, God bless Israel and nobody else. The Coliseum, right? You go in to watch the games, you'd have to stand up, put your hand over your heart, singing God bless Israel, all of that. And what you have is a prophet, Habakkuk. But he's an inverted prophet. Prophets were usually those people who God spoke a word to them, and the prophets would go around and speak to uh, uh, God's people about how they should live. So they face God, God speaks to them, they make a 180, they go and they start to speak to God's people. Habakkuk doesn't do that. He knows what's going to take place from God, and he makes a 360 and spins back, and he spends his time not talking to God's people, but to God. And what he's saying is, God, that ain't right. So I'm not going to go out here and play good Christian prophet and say what you would have me to say, because I've got beef with what you said, God. And what you see is somebody whose expectations of God and his experience of God doesn't line up. He has that same conflict that you and I have when, when it comes to doubt. But if you read ahead, you'll find that at the end of this thing, he's good. He's actually better with God than he was at the start. How does he get there? It's going to be the same way that all of us get here. My sermon in a sentence, I'm just going to tip my hat right here. If you ever want to move past your doubt, Here's how you do it. You have to turn your doubts about God into a dialogue with him. You've got to turn your doubts about God into a dialogue with him. Doubt doesn't have to mean the end of your faith. Doubt can be a thing that God uses to expand your faith beyond something that you ever imagined. And that's what he does here. And so I want to walk you through how he does it. Here's my first point. The very first thing that he does, what we all need to do, is this. Speak up. Speak up. Have you ever had problems with your cable or your Wi-Fi and you kind of call in on the phone and as you call in, uh, the person says, hello, and you start to voice your concerns and then you find out you're actually not talking to anybody. It's a recording. And you just kind of feel like, man, I could share my heart, but it seems like nobody's doing anything. I want to talk to a live person. I don't feel heard. Habakkuk's going to have a lot that he's going to talk about, the injustice that he faces, the things that cause him doubt. But look at verse 2. The very first thing that he does is he shows that he's a person of faith in the midst of his doubt. Look here at verse 2. How long, O Lord? 
must I call for help? And you don't listen and cry out to you about violence and you don't say, did you see the first thing that he did? The first thing that he's doing is he's not praying about injustice, he's praying about his prayers. How many times have, have you found yourself praying and you feel like God doesn't hear you and you say, forget this, I'm done. What he's saying is God doesn't hear me. I doubt that he's concerned, but I know that he's there, so here's how I'm going to show my faith in the midst of my doubts. I'm going to continue to speak up until he does hear me. And when he doesn't hear me, I'm going to talk to him and say, God, I don't feel like you're listening. If we're ever going to turn our doubts into a dialogue with God, the first thing that we got to do is speak up. Ask to be heard. But then he gets into verse 3. Look here at verse 3. He brings up his doubt about God's goodness. Why? Look, verse 3. Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. What he's saying is, God, I doubt your goodness because I only hear of your goodness, but you're forcing me to look at the world's badness. It's as if you have me here and you're propping my eyelids open and I'm forced to see this injustice. And he's saying, God, what are you doing? You could get rid of all of this with the snap of your fingers, but you're not snapping. Why, God? Look at verse 4, this is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. Look, for the wicked restrict the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. He's saying, God, your law is good, but the problem is the people that are making the laws and those that enforce the laws are twisting it. The law is supposed to be this watchdog to protect the weak but the people that have control of the laws have tamed this watchdog and they're sicking it on people that should be protected by it. This is somebody that could live in 2019. Say, yo, God, where are you? Everybody's seen it. There's cell phone footage everywhere and there's not an indictment at all? God, Everybody sees what's, what's wrong, and you tell me that you, the powerful God that can control it all, there's nothing that you can do? Listen, who wouldn't doubt God? Doubt is normal, and here's what, what I want you to see. Look, doubt has this way of surfacing in the hearts of people that are despondent or find themselves in despair. So what that means is that your lack of doubt in the same way that somebody else has doubted God's goodness may not mean that you have more faith than somebody else. It may just mean that you are privileged or blessed or found yourself in a place where the stimuli that caused them to doubt God hasn't quite found you yet. Sometimes privilege of being isolated from the world's badness can make us naive and a naivety can bring about an absence of doubt and the absence of doubt doesn't always mean the presence of faith. Sometimes it just means that you don't have to like Habakkuk stare the injustices of the world right in your eye. It doesn't come on your doorsteps. You can peer in and peer out. You may have grown up like I did when you heard about God as father, you could look in your home and see that you had a dad that provided. When you heard about the love of God, you've surrounded by a community or family or group of people that love you that would never think to take advantage of you. When you heard about God as healer, you found yourself in good health. So of course when you hear about God is good and God is love, it's easier for you to make that jump. 
But what about somebody else that finds himself here in this place? Or as they think of their families, the things that, the, the things that come to mind are drug addiction and abuse, molestation, not just outside of the church, but inside of the church as well, among people that should have been gods. And a God that allows the most horrible things to take place. Listen, who wouldn't doubt that? Earlier this year, I read a memoir by a lady named Itabari and Jerry. Every goodbye ain't gone. Um, she's not a Christian, but what was so helpful about her book is that as she goes on from the jump, she starts to uh, uh, explain her faith journey. And do you know when her doubts about the goodness of God started in her life? About four or five as she walked through Brooklyn with her mom. Uh, the words are going to be here on the screen, but read what she says here. Mom, why do these children look like that, I asked her, as we walked through our old Brooklyn neighborhood. I often accompanied her on her rounds when I was four or five. Her mom was a nurse. I was about that age when we passed the park and saw the knot of children, bent, big-headed, twisted, pushed around on wheels. Why, I asked her. If God was so powerful, so merciful, why? My mother answered honestly, I don't know. And that was the first strike against God, which began my vague but persistent doubts of his existence. The child skepticism grew. And throughout her book, she talks about a time where she goes back to this backwoods town to investigate uh, the murder of her grandfather that was swept under the rug years and years ago. As she talks to people, she starts to piece together this story of this drunk driver that hit her grandfather, killed him, and was let off the, 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 the hook. Her grandmother, who was light-skinned, goes to the scene of the crime the day that her grandfather dies, and as she's trying to push through the crowd, to see his head cracked open on the sidewalk, cops hold her back and say, don't worry, man. It was just the Negro. You mean to, t how could somebody who has to come face to face with that kind of injustice not Doubt, right? This is what I'm saying. This is what he sees right here. This is not somebody whose life is good sitting in a room with a cup of tea and a cigar pontificating on the goodness of God. Habakkuk is a man that finds himself face to face with injustice and he's saying, God, I don't know if these things add up. He's not one that can peer in and leave out. He's somebody that's planted in it. I bring all of that up to say, maybe you find yourself in here today and you're not a Christian or you're in here and you call yourself a Christian or you have called yourself one for some time, but a host of things, maybe the death of a loved one or just the injustices that are more prevalent and on the front page of our news feeds and timeline, those types of things have made you start to doubt God. I just want you to know right here, look, you have nothing to be ashamed of or to shame anybody else for. You aren't the only one. You're not the first one. I apologize for any way that Christians or churches have, have made you feel as if the doubt that you feel inside is abnormal or something worthy of condemning. It's it's not. It's the reflex of the human heart that sees the inconsistency of, and the evil of the world that we live in. It's normal for despair to bring doubt. And I hope that that would do something for those of us in this room who don't find ourselves doubting in that same way. 
that we would learn to treat people that find themselves here gently because we don't know their backstory, what led them to doubt, nor do we know when the stimuli that caused them doubt will come to our front doorsteps and find us. I'll tell you four years ago, six weeks before getting ready to plant a church, when I got a phone call that my 32-year-old brother with three kids died in his car out of nowhere, I'll tell you one thing that, that found me. Doubt. And I, I just didn't know what to do with it. But do you know what I did have? I had a group of people who listened more than they lectured. I had a group of folks who knew that doubt of that sort was normal and present in all of us. And they encouraged me to speak up, direct those doubts to God. We've got to turn those doubts into dialogue with God. And let me tell you this, doubts make great conversation starters. Do you find it hard to, to pray, like you just don't have enough to talk about? Doubts make great conversation starters. I remember being in sixth grade, um, and I'm not an old man, but as I look out on the room, I'm going to date myself a bit. Uh, when, when I was in sixth grade, uh, we got two landlines in our house, right? So not one, but two. And so I had my own phone line that I actually had to plug into the wall and my movement was restricted by how far that line went. Well, so as we sit and talk, uh, it was the first time that I could talk to girls on the phone without fear of my mom being able to pick up the phone. So I'm like, all right, this is great. Um, and then I call, you know, I start to talk to them and then I found out um, I'm a terrible conversationalist. So I did what all sixth graders would do and we would just sit on the phone for hours in silence. Um, and then we'd say, I right, see you tomorrow. Well, um, after starting to find out that that really doesn't work well when I'm trying to impress these girls, I thought, well, here's what I'll do. I'm a creative guy. I'm a thoughtful guy. So throughout the day, I'll take out my loose leaf sheet of paper. And what I'll do is when a conversation point comes up, I'll record it on the page and I'll write and I'll fill my page. And when that page is done, I'll flip over to the backside and fill that page. Um, and overnight, I became a sensation when I started to talk on the phone uh, and I ran out of things to talk about. I just crossed that first one off the list and I'd keep going. And they thought I was a great conversationalist, but I was actually just good at recording things and then relaying them later. This is how your doubts work when it comes to dialoguing with God. There is no rule that says they have to come uh, spontaneously in the moment as they come up, here's what you do. You pull out your phone. You write it in your notes app. You text somebody that you know is going to hold you accountable to talk about those things, and you record those doubts, every one of them. And when you find yourself alone with your thoughts, with time to pray, you turn those doubts into dialogue with God and you speak up and you realize censorship is not required and you direct those questions to, to God. That's the first thing. The first thing that we have to do is speak up. Uh, but here's point two, listen up, right? So uh, we all have those friends who uh, when they find themselves mad at you, they kind of come at you, and they have a conversation, and it's clear to you, wait a minute, uh, you've already had a conversation with me about this without me. So yeah, you've talked and come to conclusions about what I would say, and now you've come to me, and you spent time talking, but you didn't give me the chance to clarify what was said. Sometimes when it comes to the doubts that we have with God, we tend to, to do the same thing. So we'll either have a conversation without him or we'll come and just vent and think that's what it means to speak up. I just want to get this off my chest. Now I'm done. 
But that's not what takes place. If we're ever going to have a dialogue with God, we can't just speak up. We have to listen up. And so here's what takes place. He speaks, and hear this, God speaks back. Listen, the creator of words doesn't have a problem using them. If you speak up, God speaks back. Verse 5, God says this, look at the nations and observe. Be utterly astounded, for I am doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. How many of you all have heard that uh, phrase somewhere else or used in church as a good thing? Put on a t-shirt or a mug, right? Behold, I'm going to do something in your days that if you were to hear about it beforehand, you wouldn't believe it. This is why context is so important. Um, This is not a good thing that God's saying that's going to take place. Look at verse 6. He prepares him, but then verse 6 comes up. Look, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. That bitter and impetuous, we really don't use that word. It just means reckless, rash, impulsive. That bitter and impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories, not its own. And then what he's going to do is he's going to spend the rest of the time from 7 to 11 describing them. I am raising up a group of people that are fierce, godless. Look here at verse 9. All of them come to do violence. So they are not fake tough gods. God's saying all of them are killers. And what we see is God saying, uh, I'm actually not just tolerating evil. I actually have a plan to use it for my purposes. So I'm going to raise up and allow this objectively evil nation to come in and give you the justice that you want. How's that for an answered prayer? What God's saying is, the problem that you had, the thing that caused you to doubt me, uh, God's concern for our problems predates our awareness of those very problems. And he already has a plan to deal with it. Is that the answer that you would want to your prayer to your doubt? That your cry for justice would be met with God saying, yep, I'm going to bring justice on you and you're not going to like the instrument that I use. You're not going to like how I do it. There's a lot of ways that you can know that God is speaking to you. Um, Here's one way that you can know that you're actually talking to God and not an idealized version of yourself. If whenever you talk to God or whenever you think that you hear from God, God only tells you things that you like, enjoy, accept, or things that you would tell yourself, chances are you're probably not talking to God. You're probably just hearing an echo. You remember how we used to do as kids, right? You find a room that has a good echo, and you you would say things like, John's great, John's great, John's great, John's great, And, and you would have this conversation, but you were talking to yourself. Here, Habakkuk is crying for God to show justice, and God's saying, I am going to show justice. I'm going to give you the justice that you want, but it's not going to come in a way that you're particularly going to like. So here's one thing that we see, all right? We are going to turn our doubts about God into a dialogue, but I want you to know this. Uh, God can speak very, very clearly. But just because God speaks clearly uh, doesn't mean that there's no confusion, right? Sometimes God does things, and we have questions about what he does, 
and we ask him why, and he gives an answer, and it doesn't help. It just gives us more questions. God is a God of revelation that speaks to us. God doesn't speak in riddles, but sometimes when God speaks, you and I say, you, you got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. And so here's what I want you to know. You've got to turn your doubts about God into a dialogue. And what that means is that we can speak up. God will speak back so we can listen up. God speaks clearly through his word, right? God's church, God's people is a great way for, for us to hear from God. Providence, how God does things in the world, is a great way for us to hear back. But after we speak up, after we listen up, we still don't come to conclusions. That's not a dialogue. Speak up, listen to up, and thirdly, follow up. This is how we really know we're in a dialogue with somebody where they say something, and we don't just leave it at what they say. We say, wait a minute. No, 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 wait a minute, right? This is not a... Uh, carnival and when it comes to conversing with God you get one ticket and once you use that you can't ride the ride anymore this is him saying no 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 no. anytime that confusion and doubt comes up follow up with God so look what he does here in verse 12 verse 12 he says this are you not from eternity Lord my God my Holy One, you will not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish us. Look, this is somebody that's absolutely confused, not just about God's actions, but God's answers. But listen, his confusion doesn't keep him from staying close. As he's reaffirming these truths about God in verse 12, there's a word that's repeated. Do you know what that word is? My. Not just God, my God. All right, I know that you exist and I know that we're close. My. My holy one. All right, I know that you're holy, that you care about justice. God, and I still want to be close, but I don't get it. My rock. God, I know that you're steady. I know that you don't change and you've been my rock. I'm reaffirming the things that I know to be true about you. Sometimes you and I spend so much time on um, insight, trying to gain insight into what God's trying to do in the world and how things add up, when instead you and I should spend our time on hindsight, what God has done, reminding, rehearsing about God's faithfulness. That's why we do what we do week in and week out. That's why we sing these songs. That's why somebody from the stage is going to come up here and wherever they are in the Bible, they're going to preach the gospel to you, the work of what Christ has done to remind you of these truths. He's rehearsing these things. He knows that you know, disagreement with how God does things, listen, it doesn't have to mean distance. You don't have to go far. What relationship do you have that is conflictless? Who in here is married and agrees with their spouse about everything? None of us do. But when it comes to Christianity, we live as if Disagreement with God means that we have to create some kind of distance, and what I'm saying, it doesn't. He reaffirms these truths, and then he, he, he doesn't just stop there. It's not like he, he says, all right, God, I know that you're good. I'm just going to give you the benefit of the doubt and trust you. He restates his problem, verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why, God, why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? He said, God, at first I didn't think that you cared. I doubted your concern. But now, God, I'm doubting the wisdom of your course of action. 
And he brings all those things right to God's front doorstep. And he even reminds God about the wickedness of the nation that he sent. Verse 14 to 17, he just outlines, he's like, God, you made us like fish in a barrel, and the Chaldeans were known for showing their dominance over people by stringing them together through their top lips and putting them in nets so that they could see y'all are like fish to us, and then praising their gods because of how they enforce this on them. And he's saying, God, these are the people that you're getting ready to turn us over, over to, and they're not going to show us any mercy. God, I know I cried for justice, ah, but now I know that any cry for justice is eventually going to be a cry for judgment because you're holy and perfect. And, and now we're saying, verse 17, God, where's the mercy? I just want to remind you all where we started. The goal of my time here is not to try to resolve every doubt that you have about Christianity or the faith. At the end of this book, Habakkuk finds himself in a better place with God than he did at the start of it. But in order to get there, you kind of have to go through the whole book, and I'm just preaching through the first chapter. What I want to do is spend my time on what you do with doubt. Right, I used to have this Ford Explorer back in the day. Uh, it was a two-door with a little hatchback on the back, and I would close all of the doors, but I would step in my car, and I would still see the door ajar sign. So I found out that when I closed that back hatch, I had a window thing on the back that, that I had to go back and just press in. Now, to the day that that car died, I never quite fixed that issue. But what I did learn was that when I stepped in the car and I saw that light pop up, I knew where the problem was and I knew how to take care of it in the moment. That's all I'm trying to do here today. When doubt springs up, when that sign pops up that says, hey, there's a hole in this thing, there's a hole in your, your faith, what do you do with that doubt? You turn it into a dialogue with God. You, you speak up. You voice those things to God uncensored. And you take time and you sit and you listen. You, you hear him speak. And where he's confusing, you go back and follow up. And then you listen. And where he's confusing, you go back and you just keep that volley back and forth. But you turn those doubts to him. The problem is, we can know that. That may not be new information. You can know that, but sometimes we find ourselves facing tragedies, facing trouble, facing injustice, and we just don't have the wherewithal on the inside to speak to God. We can find ourselves facing things like we did in the <laughs> summer of 2016, can find ourselves facing things in our neighborhood, on the daily, on the weekly, in our families, in our homes, where it's hard for us to speak up and we can't be the ones to take the initiative. What do you do then? What do you do when your doubt absolutely suffocates you and you don't even have enough doubt to, to follow these steps? Do you know what you do? You sit back and you can be reminded of the good news, of the gospel, that when it comes to resolving our doubts, our doubts that would take us from God, we don't just need God to give us instructions about what to do, how to take care of that doubt. We need somebody to actually come and rescue us from that doubt. And this is what God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Listen. 
Jesus came into this world as the word of God. So the very uh, uh, being who was God himself to reveal God's heart and God's love to us. Jesus was God in the flesh and Jesus lived this life how we're called to live completely by faith in God. As he observed the badness of what goes on in this world, he had this unwavering commitment and faith in the good of God. And as Jesus lived this life, do you know what he was constantly met with by the people that were closest to him? Doubt. So one time they were on this boat. The storm kind of came. They felt that they were going to die. The disciples felt like they were, were, were going to die. People are straining at the oars, and they look up, and they can't find Jesus. They say, yo, Peter, where's Jesus? And they go, and they find him um, in the little uh, uh, basement of the ship, curled up with a blanket tucked right up under his chin, sleeping. And do you know what they do? They don't dialogue with him and ask him, why are you asleep? They hurl an indictment. How could you? How could you be sleeping? Don't you care? And Jesus gets up, calms the storm, talks to him about faith. Jesus has a friend, Lazarus, who was sick. He'd already healed a bunch of folks, so his friends reached out and like, Jesus, you're a healer. Come and heal him. Jesus lets him die. When he gets there and meets the people, they don't say, what took you so long? Why did you let him die? Instead, they say, how could you? If you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. They hurled this doubt at him. He raises him from the dead and gives them a picture of God's glory that they wouldn't have seen outside of that tragedy. When his cousin John the Baptist finds himself in jail, they said, Jesus, we heard about that sermon that you preached in Luke 4 when you first came on the scene, that you came to set the captives free. Jesus, I'm a captive. Are you really the one to come or should I be expecting somebody else? Jesus takes that doubt. Constantly surrounded by people that, that doubt his care for them because of the badness that they feel in the world. And he takes it and he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't blow out anybody's faith because of their doubt. Then on the night before he's getting ready to go to the cross, he tells Peter, James, and John, and the twelve, hey, Listen, do you remember that stuff in the Bible about um, God's going to use the wicked to swallow up the righteous? Well, I'm that guy. I'm God's righteous son. And, and hear this. God's going to crush me and give me judgment so that he can give you the mercy that you don't deserve. And as Jesus talks about his course of action, do you know what Peter does? He meets him with doubt and says, not that way. How dare you go about it that way? So Jesus was isolated, not because of his doubt, but because of his faith. And we have these two prayers that are recorded of him all alone. In a garden, he gets on his knees and he prays and he says, God, if there's any other way, yo, I mean, I'm all for how you want to do it, but if there's any other way, not my will but yours be done. God reaffirms to him that this is the way he gets up and he moves with courage. And then on the cross, he cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? Habakkuk felt forsaken and he cried out to God, and as a sinful man, he got an answer. Jesus actually was forsaken, cried out to God, and as a righteous man, he didn't get any answer. And he was completely swallowed up by the wicked. He got God's judgment. And not only that, but he rose from the dead. And you would think, finally, 
that's going to be the thing that gets people out of their doubt. But do you know what you find at the end of the gospel accounts? The disciples are still doubting him. After he dies in Luke 24, they're on this walk and they're talking, right, not to God about their doubts, but to one another about, man, I can't believe that our friend died as they're staring this injustice, this state-sanctioned murder that was reproved by the religious leaders as they talk about this injustice and they're doubting God's goodness. They're overcome with despair. John chapter 20, they, they lock themselves in a room and are talking to one another about their disappointment. Nobody's speaking up to God about their doubts, but here's the good thing. Our Savior, that not only took God's judgment and gave us mercy, doesn't wait for you and I to speak up before he gives us that good news. Jesus goes and finds them in their doubt and proclaims the good things that God has done. He finds this this doubt-filled people, and he doesn't condemn them be, because of their doubt, but the first thing that he says is, peace be to you. He rescues them from out of their doubt, and look at what he does. He doesn't just give them permission to go to God with their doubts. He, he gives you and I a script of the very words to say and to voice to where even if you don't know it, can go to Psalm 13, and it starts and it says, how long, how long? And you can say, me too. You can go to Revelation 6.10 at the end and see even the saints in the presence of God are saying to him now, God, how long until you vindicate us? And you start to find that the presence of doubt doesn't exclude you from being a person of faith. All people of faith do is say, no, no, listen, Jesus rescued me from out of my doubt by proclaiming this good news. He showed me that he took God's justice so that I could experience God's mercy, the relationship that comes with him. And he invites me into dialogue. Your doubt doesn't preclude you from relationship with God. Your doubt can actually be a precursor to a more rich and full relationship with Jesus than you ever imagined. Wind can do two things when it comes to flames, right? Wind can blow out the flame of your faith, or what wind can do, if it's channeled rightly, it can take a small spark and set a forest on fire. In Matthew chapter 12, 20, look at what it says about how the Lord Jesus treats a smoldering wick. Matthew 12, 20, it says this. He won't break a bruised reed. Listen. And he won't put out a smoldering wick. What Jesus does is take this little spark of faith and he cares for it and he blows it. And he cares for it and he blows into it. And if we direct our doubts to him, we can see our faith set ablaze. And so here's the only thing that I want you to do with the information that I gave you. Because of what Christ has done for us, he died on the cross to make us right with God so that those of us that put our faith in him are now sons and daughters. We have direct access to God, and we can use that direct access to God to direct our doubts in the most direct language directly to God. All of them, we, 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 we can take them and record them and not have to censor ourselves and take them right to his doorstep and say, God, it doesn't make sense. Help me. And what we'll find is that if we direct our doubts directly to God in the most direct language, that small amount of faith that we have, can set a 
forest ablaze. The only reason I bring this up is because if, if Austin is anything like Atlanta, uh, what I know is that in these past few years, I mean, and there's nothing new un, 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 under the sun, the prevalence of injustice that is constantly before us at all times, the people who have a veneer of Christianity but that lacks any real commitment that are purveyors of this injustice can cause a lot of us who are both in the church and outside of the church to lose faith in God and what I've seen? Is it people who wave the banner of Christianity that do some horrendous things can cause people that have sat in pews for 20 years passively ingesting stuff from the stage, it can cause them to think that they know what Christianity is all about and to start to take their doubts and to dialogue with ideologies and people and things and have a fervency in dialogue here that they never had when they were actually inside the church and as a result be convinced that there's something wrong with God. And all that I'm saying is before you do that or if you're already there as you do that, have some integrity and extend your faith to this God who doesn't just want to give you advice about how to get out of your doubt, but who sent his son to rescue you from your doubt. Have the faith to continue to go to him and direct your thoughts towards him. About eight years ago, my wife and I had a young man that was a part of our church, and uh, we asked him to live with us. He was somebody that had faith in God, and our goal uh, was to help him grow in his faith to God. Uh, two and a half years later, after the pastor asking him to come and live with him, uh, two and a half years later, he actually walked away from the faith. Four years after that, was sitting at my, my study in the back of my house, and he says, John, as life has gotten better for me, I've run into trouble that I can't just shake. And he talked about the suicidal thoughts that he had, all the doubts that he had. And as we sat there, I mean, I wish I had a silver bullet to give to him, but I didn't. All I said was, come around. There's a God that wants to hear every one of your doubts. I asked him when the last time that he had peace was, and he said, four years ago when I left the church. And so I'm like, just, just try it again. Just come back. Direct your thoughts directly to God with the most direct language possible and see if God doesn't speak back and provide some kind of resolution. And as the days and the months went by, he gave this. He didn't get an answer to all of his qualms. He didn't get a resolution to all of his doubts, but one thing that he did get was as he started to be honest with God of, uh, about his doubts in the context of a community that has faith in God and wants to extend that faith by the way we take our doubts to him, what he found was there was a bunch of people there that said, me too, me too, me too. And it cured him of the misconception that felt as if in order to be a person of faith, I can't have any doubts. Being a person of faith is not about the presence or the absence of doubts. It's just your posture towards your doubts. What do you do with them? Do you allow them to blow out your faith? And do you think disagreement with God has to mean distance? Or even when you're confused, Will you believe God's love for you is shown in Jesus and stay close? Give him your doubts and see if channeling your doubts that way doesn't lead you to a place where your faith is expanded far beyond what you can imagine. Your doubts don't have to cause you to run away. I'd wager that the person right next to you has had some of the same one. It's been said that friendship begins at the moment that somebody says to somebody else, me too. I thought I was the only one. And in a room this size, you're never the only one. 
turn your doubts about God into a dialogue with him and meet a God who doesn't condemn people for doubting, but who rescues us from out of it. Let's pray. Oh, our Savior, we are thankful that doubt doesn't have to be the end of our story. It can be the beginning, Father. Oh, would you give us the faith to redirect them, to turn them to you, Father? Would you give us the faith uh, to listen more than we lecture and listen before we lecture? Give us sympathetic hearts. Help us to turn people to Jesus, our Savior, who will not blow out a smoldering wick, but who will nurture even the little bit of faith that we have, Father. We ask that you would do this and so much more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.